I'd like to thank each and every one of you for coming out tonight. I hope I say something that unsettles you, <laughs> that unnerves you, maybe even for an instance, unhouses you. I must say I get very excited when I come to Santa Fe, New Mexico, because this city has a very special place in my heart that my lovely and precious daughter Zaytun was born here in St. Vincent Hospital on St. Michael Street. So I shall go to my grave with very, very pleasant memories of, of, of Santa Fe, uh, New Mexico. So even as I come to unsettle you, I do it in a spirit of generosity. <laughs> Sympathy, very much so. But this is, in fact, serious uh, business that we're focusing on today. And that's why I want to begin on a Socratic note. I don't think it's possible to talk about cultural freedom without talking about the example of Socrates. Yes, that flat-nosed, big-lipped, huge neck, pot belly, barefoot Athenian who went around doing what? Infecting people with the perplexity that he had been infected with. That's, that's the line in Theotetus and Plato's dialogue. And for me, it's impossible to talk about cultural freedom. It's impossible to talk about political vision. It's impossible to talk about existential engagement without acknowledging the legacy of Athens. We turn to line 38A in Plato's Apology, the unexamined life is not worth living. And of course, Malcolm X adds, the examined life is painful. <laughs> and to engage in Socratic activity, the activity of self-examination, self-interrogation, self-questioning requires courage. Courage to do what? To think for one's self. William Butler Yeats is right when he says it takes more courage to dig deep into the dark corners of one's own soul and wrestle with what one finds than it does for a soldier to fight on the battlefield. And part of the problem in our nation, in our world, is we don't have enough fellow citizens and human beings who are willing to exercise the courage to think critically for themselves. America. Gosh, and I thought I was lucky sitting in the front row listening to Dr. Cornell West, and here I am uh, now uh, getting to do what um, I think people who are listening right now on the radio around the country at KUNM and all of you. Um, want to do, which is try to uh, wrestle with some of the issues that mm. Dr. West just talked about, Professor West. Um, but I wanted to go back for a minute mm. to the day you were born, <laughs> 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 to, to where you were born, to Tulsa, Oklahoma, and how that affected your life, um, to talk about your family, your parents. Well, I appreciate you starting with mom and dad because uh, that's really the place to begin with me. You know, I've always said if I could be uh, one-third the person my father was and one-tenth the person my mother is, I could really set some things on fire in a positive way. You know? uh, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I've been in, it's aspiring, actually, to uh, meet at least some of the standards that they set. Mom and dad were both born in Jim Crow, Louisiana. Dad then moved to uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma with his grandfather, who was a Baptist minister, Reverend C.L. West, the Metropolitan Baptist Church in Northeast Tulsa. Uh, and when you mentioned the Tulsa riot in 1921 and the burning down of, uh, of Wall Street, you know the Gap Band, the Rhythm and Blues Band, Gap Band, they, they were born in the same hospital. That GAP stands for Greenwood, Archer, and Pine. That's why they call it Gap Band, you see. The Greenwood, Archer, and Pine was the corner of Black Wall Street where John Hope Franklin, you all know John Hope Franklin, the greatest historian. His, his father was a lawyer there, worked for the Oklahoma Eagle. Uh, uh, so many, I mean, Oklahoma has a rich history, a very rich history. Uh, so I'm very glad to be from Oklahoma, even though I know a lot of people understand that. Uh, uh, 
but, the, uh, uh, but then we ended up in California. I grew up in Sacramento. My father got a job with, uh, 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 with the, uh, he was a civilian in the Air Force, one of the few spaces where black people could work at that time. And we went to Jim Crow, California. And I had a magnificent childhood with my brother and two sisters. How did you end up um, going to, going through your formal education? Did you always know from a young age that you wanted to be an academic, a professor? No, not really. I, uh, I, I was a gangster, really, at about seven years old. I mean, I really was. I really was. I would, uh, I, I would kind of uh, mistreat the, uh, my fel fellow mates. I was like a Robin Hood, actually. So I would take their money, and I would give it to the kids in school who didn't have anything. They'd come to school with one shoe or what have we make sure they had two shoes. They didn't have a sugar daddy. Make sure I give them a sugar daddy and so that kind of thing. And that was wrong, but I had the right idea, I think. <laughs> because I think what happened was that I underwent a conversion in my church, Shiloh Baptist Church, when I was seven. And everybody looked at me and said, Little Ronnie, man, you just have really changed. You're a different human being. And I said, yeah, I'm different. I'm a Christian now. And uh, that, for me, was fundamental. It was basic, and it still is. I decided then that he or she who's greatest among you will be your servant and you must be faithful unto death of telling the truth and bearing witness and being ready to die for what you believe in. And I decided that then. I remember I saw Brother Martin when I was 10. My mother went to see Brother Martin when I was 10 and I felt that about him. I, didn't, I never wanted to imitate him, but I felt that about him. You know. uh, the Black Panther Party was right next to our church in Sacramento and I spent a lot of time in the Black Panther Party, but I never joined because they were they had a deep anti-Christian bias, you know, and they had a handkerchief head nigger of the week was always a preacher. And I asked, why no doctors, teachers, pharmacists, always a preacher? But they said, black church is reactionary across the board. And I said, well, I can't join this over because I'm bearing witness in my own life that something positive had happened in that church because I was a gangster. Now I'm freedom fighter. And they're not the same thing, you know. Even though, as I said, Robin Hood had the right idea, but the, the, the different, there's a continuity there. But it's different, too. And uh, I've, I've had that same uh, attitude. Up, uh, I'm 50 years old now. Same one. It became different once I, uh, I went to public high schools in Sacramento. Then when I went to Harvard and, uh, and then Princeton, I learned a lot of things. Uh, the life of the mind was just unbelievable. I was, it was emancipating in a lot of ways. But it didn't change my calling, my vocation at all. It's been the same all the way, all the way through. Um, and that's been a blessing, actually, because I can't conceive of a life of more joy than fighting for freedom.